Matthew 5. We are in the middle of a series called Rebels, and we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and we're talking about what does it mean to live countercultural lives for Jesus um, in the world that we live in? What does it mean to follow Jesus in, in society? What does it mean? How do we live? What kind of attitude should reflect of us? How does Jesus respond, and how does Jesus demand things from our lives as his followers? And over the last couple of weeks, we looked at topics like anger and lust. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a topic of marriage and divorce, a challenging topic in the society that we live in. And so if you have your Bibles, Matthew 5, 31 and 32 is what we're going to be looking at. Let me read it for you. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I want to take you back to 1991. There's a man by the name of Larry who was living the fairy tale life. He was the toast of Hollywood celebrities at Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. He happened to be at the right place at the right time and meet the right woman that changed his life forever. He was a blue-collar construction worker whose total assets probably amounted to a pickup truck and a few tools. But that day, he was the frog who was marrying the princess. However, there was no fairy tale ending for Larry and his wife. 20 years after he said, I do, in front of celebrities like Michael Jackson and Eddie Murphy and Nancy Reagan and Quincy Jones, just to name a few, he was now a loner, bloated, drunk, out of money, his health, dissipated by drugs and alcohol. He was a shadow of the man who once traveled in private jets and yachts with his princess. Now, in his early 60s, his memory is fading and his words are slurred. And in an interview he did a few years ago, I think about three years ago, he showed off to the interviewer a few trinkets, leftover scraps from his five-year marriage. He was especially proud of his wedding photo. His wife looked stunning in her $25,000 dress and he was handsome in his J.C. Penney suit. Unfortunately, his marriage wasn't made in heaven. The construction worker had been arrested for drunk driving after he totaled his pickup truck. A judge committed him to the Betty Ford Clinic, and it was there that he met his future wife, and the two alcoholics got hitched. This was his third marriage. It was her eighth marriage. She once bragged that she only slept with men that she was married to but she would quickly get tired of her men after her marriage. She was once quoted as saying, the excitement is in the getting, not in the keeping. But in the past, she's always married big-time celebrities. Previous people that she was married to included millionaires, movie stars, even a U.S. senator. Her name was Elizabeth Taylor. And at her wedding to Larry, she said that she finally found a man that would make her happy. Unfortunately, he believed the lie and thought that he could do what a senator and a hotel mogul and a movie star couldn't do. And in the end, he was rejected by her as well. And in the interview, the reporter mentions that as he was about to leave, he noticed Larry just hunched over in a daze. And he looked at the reporter and he said, divorce makes you a lot less than you used to be. Divorce makes you a lot less than you used to be. See, I think that's exactly what Jesus is trying to communicate to us this morning in the text from the Sermon on the Mount. When he begins to talk about this touchy subject of divorce, divorce makes you a lot less than you used to be. The stats on divorce in our culture are shocking. 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 70% of second marriages do so as well. One in four kids today are raised in a home with no father around. Over two million kids live in a home where dad is not present. Four out of five men in prison today grew up in a home where dad was not present. And a recent study by Stanford University found that the disintegration of the family unit is the number one cause of poverty in our society. Recently deceased Robin Williams once complained after a messy divorce, he said, my wife tried in court 
and the judge wiped her tears away with my checkbook. Jay Leno used to joke, marriage is grand, but divorce is about 20 grand. <laughs> and before his divorce, Kurt Cobain from the rock band Nirvana had an interview with MTV and said, I had a great childhood till I was about nine, and then a divorce messed up the rest of my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've suffered from a divorce. Maybe you grew up in a home that experienced a divorce. See, the reality is that marriage is never easy. One comedian once quipped that marriage is the chief cause of all divorces. But you contrast that to what Jesus says in our text, and you see that Jesus places a high value on marriage. He places a high value on staying true to your spouse. He wants us to succeed where others have failed. And listen, I'm recognized this morning that there are several different groups of people that I'm talking to this morning. And can I suggest to you that Jesus is speaking to each one of us. Maybe in this room, you are at the pinnacle of your marriage. You have a great marriage, but you can make a good thing better. Maybe your marriage is slowly drifting down a lazy river. It's gotten into a dull routine, and you need to revive the passion. Maybe your marriage might be at the edge of a cliff, and it feels like it's about to fall apart any day now. Maybe this morning you're looking at a, through the rearview mirror. You've experienced the wreckage of a divorce, and you need healing and hope in your life. There might be some of you in this room that have been married for years and years, and you've gone through the good, the bad, the ugly, but you fought through it and you survived, and you're standing together stronger. And this morning, Jesus might be calling you to help others in their marriage. And finally, there's a bunch of you want to be hopefuls. You young, single guys waiting for your knight in shining armor or your princess to show up. And this morning, can I suggest to you that you need to be grounded in biblical principles that will help you succeed in your future marriage to the person that God already has planned and designed for your life. And in just two short verses, Jesus will tell us several things about marriage and divorce that all of us need to hear this morning. The first thing that he'll talk about is the hardness of marriage. In verse 31, Jesus said, It was also said that whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. The passage that Jesus is talking to them about is found all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 24. And you've got to ask the question, why would Moses allow divorce to the Old Testament Jews. Over back in Matthew 19, Jesus makes this comment that Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. What does he mean? See, back in ancient Egypt, where the Israelites were slaves for 400 years, the Egyptian men held all the cards in marriage. There was virtually a no-fault clause for divorce for Egyptian men. They didn't even have to get, go to court to get permission to divorce their wives. If he got tired of his wife, all he had to do was put her out of her house, and she was gone. No questions asked. If he got angry, he could beat her to death and actually face no repercussions at all from the authorities. And after being around that culture for 400 years, the Jewish people began to take on some of the customs from these Egyptians. And Moses sees the cruelty that was in the heart of these men. He watched the suffering of the women, the destruction of children, and the breakdown of the family unit because of this no-fault divorce. And so he gave the people three principles for a divorce. Number one, he says, there are limited reasons for a divorce. A husband has to prove by two or three people in a court of law that his wife has a moral defect. Secondly, he says, there needs to be a certificate of divorce. You guys remember in the Old Testament, adultery was never a grounds for divorce in the Old Testament. If you were caught in adultery, you didn't just leave your marriage. What would happen is you'd be stoned to death. That was Old Testament law. So before Moses instituted these laws, a man could throw his wife out of the house for any reason. And there was a bunch of religious zealots that assumed that she was thrown out for adultery or marital unfaithfulness. And they would take stones and would stone these women. 
So Moses required that she would be given a certificate of divorce that stated that she was dismissed not because of adultery, but for reasons that were allowed by the law. Third reason, you couldn't remarry the person that you once divorced. If a man divorces his second wife or she dies, he couldn't just go back to his previous wife. He couldn't just say, hey, I'm going to leave you for a little while, go enjoy it, and then I'll come back to you later. Marriage wasn't something you could walk into and walk out of whenever you wanted to do that. And so rather than encouraging divorce, Moses was actually making it much harder to get than it used to be. But you know how we are, right? Um, I give my kids a rule, and what do they do? They try to find every loophole around that rule. And that's exactly what the Israelites were doing. They have this rule, and they're like, how do we get around this? How do we find a loophole in this? We're always looking for loopholes in every law that's given to us. And by the time we get to Jesus' day, it was open season on women. Again, the rules were stacked in favor of men. Moses said that you could divorce your wife if you found anything indecent about her. And by the time we get to the time of Jesus, almost everything constituted indecency. A man could say things like, well, my wife has an indecent personality. She's out. My wife is an indecent cook. My wife is an indecent lover. She's an indecent mom. She's indecent in how she cleans the house. There was basically a no-fault no fault divorce for men. And Jesus looks at this, and he sees it as legalized adultery. His view of marriage is that it is a lifelong commitment. And over in Matthew 19, Jesus reminds the religious leaders that Gen of Genesis 2, where we're taught that the reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and they will become one flesh. Jesus is communicating to us there that marriage is God's idea and that it is God's invention. He is the one that sets the rules for it. Marriage is for life. To break it is to go against God's plan, is to go against God himself. That's why you find over in Malachi chapter 2 the statement that God hates Divorce. See, at the core of every divorce is the hardness of our heart. It's the hardness of the human heart. A husband and a wife have shut their hearts off to each other. The hardness of our hearts ultimately leads to the destruction of marriage. You remember the Beatitudes that we looked at a few weeks ago that says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Over in Matthew 18, right before Jesus begins to talk to the religious leaders about divorce and remarriage, he tells them a parable. He tells about this king who has a servant, someone that works for him, that owes him a ton of money. And there's no way this guy can repay him. So one day the king brings him into his courts and says, your debts, forgiven. You no longer owe them. This guy is celebrating, he's rejoicing, he's walking down the street, and all of a sudden he sees a co-worker who probably owes him maybe $10, $15, nothing big. But he sees the guy and he immediately gets angry. He begins to beat him, he gets to harass him, throws him into prison, and demands that this man repay his debt. This guy receives great mercy in his own life for something that he would never be able to repay but he refuses to show a little mercy to someone who owes him a small debt. See, here's the point that Jesus is making. As the bride of Christ, he is our husband. We are his bride. None of us have ever treated our spouses as badly as we've treated Jesus. See, if Christ were to apply for a divorce from his church on the grounds of cruelty and adultery and desertion, he could easily get one. But what do you see from Jesus? He patiently bears with us. He never leaves or forsakes us. He doesn't withdraw his love from us when we disappoint him. He would never think of putting us away. We have run after other lovers. We've run after other passions. We've ran from Jesus, but he still allows us to come back to him. We've gone years without giving ourselves to him. But the moment we repent, he takes us back into his arms. He's the king whose mercy forgives a debt that none of us could ever repay. And just Jesus says, when we deal with other people, we're quick to find indecent excuses, to find faults in our spouses or other people, to push them aside, to reject them, to have nothing to do with them. 
It is the hardness of our hearts that allows us not to show mercy to other people. And if the hardness of our hearts can't show mercy, should we expect mercy from God or anyone else for that matter? The second thing that Jesus talks about is the consequences of divorce. Over in verse 32, he says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a woman so divorced commits adultery. For Jesus, there's only one reason for divorce, marital unfaithfulness. The Greek word there is porneia, from which we get the word pornography. It literally means to go against the natural order. Porneia is anything that violates God's order for marriage that's found in Genesis 2. Sexual intimacy only after wedding vows, only in a monogamous relationship, only between a husband and a wife. Listen, Jesus is crystal clear and uncom uncompromising. There are no other grounds for divorce. The fact that men change the rules don't matter. The fact that a divorce court declares it doesn't make it so. Later in Matthew 19, the religious leaders try to come and try to make Jesus change his mind and get him to change his position. And again, he repeats, the only reason for divorce is porneia. Jesus wants us to know that if we put away our spouses, we have some responsibility for what happens to them. Notice it says he causes her to commit adultery. In an ancient world, when a man put a woman out of his home, she had no place to go. Their culture said she could not even go back to her own house. She had three options. She becomes a beggar on the streets. She resorts to prostitution. And she, or she hopes that someone would marry her. Those were her only three options. And Jesus goes on to say that a man who takes her in is also guilty of adultery. He's hooking up with someone else who, in God's eyes, is still bound to her first husband. Can I suggest to you that these are hard words for those of us who live in a permissive society with a no-fault divorce? Like the Jews in Moses' day, God's people have taken on practices of the Egyptians. Like the Jews in Jesus' day, God's people try to find loopholes for to, in his law to bail out of unhappy marriages. But Jesus is saying that we are responsible for the consequences of divorce, what it does to children of divorce, how it affects the spouse that we walk away from, and how it affects the future relationships with others. There's a Jewish proverb that says, when two divorced people get remarried, four people climb into the marriage bed. You can never move into a new marriage completely unscathed from your past. You create problems that outlive us, pass on to generations yet to come. A lot more than just two individuals are affected by a divorce. And having said all that, he now goes to the third point, the legitimacy of divorce. He says there's one legitimate reason for divorce. He says, except for marital unfaithfulness. There's that Greek word, porneia. This is the sole reason that divorce is allowed that allows a spouse to move on and remarry in the future. He says the same thing in Matthew 19. He says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. See, unless your spouse has committed porneia, you are still married to him or her in God's eyes. To marry anyone else is to commit adultery. Again, what you think, what your marriage counselor thinks, what culture believes, what your attorney argues, or even what the judge says matters nothing in the courts of heaven if God says otherwise. But here's the problem. We have too narrowly defined the word porneia. Remember I said earlier that it refers to the natural order of things. In Matthew 19, verse 5, Jesus argues with the religious leaders that adultery is defined by God's design for marriage found in Genesis 2. We looked at it last week when we talked about lust. It involves three things. Number one, it involves commitment. A man shall leave his father and mother, forsaking all others, and devote himself only unto her. Number two, it involves covenant. He 
he cleaves to his wife. This is our covenant or our wedding vows that says, I'm going to fully devote myself to my wife and no one else. Number three, it's consummation. The two become one flesh. This is the sexual act, the intimacy of the marriage bed that follows the covenant. All of this is God's order of things. We talked about last week how we as society, we reverse this. We start by consummation. Let's have sex and see if we're compatible. Then let's move in together and see if we can live together. Then maybe we'll make a commitment. We reversed it. But God's order is commitment first, then covenant, then consummation. Any violation of it is porneia, marital unfaithfulness or adultery. But here's the thing. As a church, we have only seen porneia in negative terms. We've seen it the first part and the third part of Genesis 2. Commitment has to do with the exclusiveness of marriage. Consummation has to do with the monogamous aspect of sexual relationship. So our definition of adultery focuses on the first and the third, forsaking all others and becoming one flesh. Therefore, adultery is usually seen in terms of a spouse cheating by having an affair with someone who's not his or her spouse. But there's a problem. We neglect the second aspect, the covenant, the vow to cleave and to give ourselves to our spouse. Can I suggest to you that adultery is not only giving yourself to someone else, but according to scripture, it is also refusing to give yourself to your spouse. It is not only going after someone else, but it's also abandoning your spouse. Abandonment also constitutes porneia, to abandon the person altogether by moving out of the house and moving away is porneia. To abandon the marriage bed is porneia. To abandon your spouse in the marriage bed is porneia. To wall yourself off emotionally from your spouse is porneia. Marital unfaithfulness involves abandoning your covenant and vow that you would cleave to and cling to your spouse. St. Paul says it this way, a man who does not take care of his family has abandoned his faith and is worse than a pagan. What about someone who abuses and batters their spouse? Isn't that unfaithfulness to the covenant of giving yourself only unto her or only unto him? See, I can hear some of you now or imagine some of you now thinking, but doesn't that put us on a slippery slope? If we aren't careful, aren't we right back to where the Jews were in Jesus' day? We're looking for loopholes in the law of God. If we start talking abuse, can't people begin to define it in all kinds of creative ways? If we talk about a man not taking care of his family, can't we come up with silly ways that he doesn't take care of his family? You bet you can. It would be easier to have a narrow view of adultery as only cheating sexually on your spouse. But Genesis 2 and Matthew 19 suggest that there is also a responsibility of taking care of your spouse. That, too, falls under the issue of marital faithfulness or porneia, God's natural order or design for marriage. But God, there is a protection to playing games with God's law of marriage. And there's where we'll get to number four, the checks and balances of divorce. Jesus gives us two checks and balances in the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, he gives us the altar. Verse 21, when we talked about anger, there's a statement there that says, if you're offering a gift at the altar and there remember that someone has something against you, your brother has something against you, go and resolve that issue. Can I suggest to you that your spouse is probably the closest person to you, your brother, your sister? Jesus is saying something incredibly profound there. He's saying that it's at the place of prayer that God brings critical issues to mind. It's there that we remember the conflicts of life. 
It is there that the Spirit of God convicts us. It is there that the Spirit of God clarifies issues for us. We should never evaluate the state of our marriage in the heat of anger or by our feelings or according to what our friends say or what a marriage counselor says or what a divorce lawyer, lawyer tells us. See, God's given us the altar of prayer so that we could take our problems to him there. And there we prayed the prayer of King David in Psalm 39. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any wickedness in me and lead me into the way of life everlasting. Notice David doesn't say, God, go figure out my spouse. Go find all the wrong things about her. See if there's any wickedness in her. David begins by saying, God, search me. Show me where I'm at fault. Show me what's going on in my life that I need to correct. Show me what's wrong with me. See, we're too busy trying to fix the other person that we never pause to reflect and say, God, examine me. What's going on inside of me? See, but we also need to be careful because we can deceive ourselves in prayer. I worked at a counseling center several years ago. And I was answering the call one day, and the lady called and said, God told me that I'm supposed to leave my husband. I'm like, really? All of these passages in Scripture that God hates divorce, and you're supposed to be loyal to your wife, and God told you. And she's like, yeah, I prayed, and the Spirit of God told me. And I was like, I don't think that's God's Spirit, right? And so we need to be careful because we can think that carnal feelings or wishful thinking are God's Spirit speaking to us. So Jesus gives us a second checks and balance, and he gives us, the church. In Matthew 18, he says that when we have problems with a person, a brother or sister, with a person that's offended us first, like in our case, marriage, it could be your spouse, you should go to that person directly. Secondly, if that doesn't work, you should bring a third party in as a witness. In the case of a marriage, that might be a godly friend or an elder or someone who's a Christian counselor. If that doesn't work, he doesn't say, then go to divorce court. He says, if that doesn't work in verse 17, he says, tell it to the church. By that means, he tell, says, tell it to the leadership of church. This is God's court. Jesus makes two promises about that court. Number one, he says, when they gather, he's in their midst. He's there. When they are coming in my name, I will be there. Verse 20 of Matthew 18, for two or three Gather together in my name. I am with them. Jesus never promises to show up in a divorce court. But he promises to show up in church to breathe his spirit and give wisdom and direction and insight. Secondly, he will honor whatever the church decides. Verse 19, I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There are difficult divorce cases. None of us should decide them on our own or take them to a divorce court first. Obviously, a church can't grant a legal divorce, but it can make a spiritual determination that will stand up in the courts of heaven if it's decided prayerfully and biblically. This leads me to the final point, the prevention and healing of divorce. Listen, guys, if this is serious business for Jesus, if marriages matter to Jesus, if he pauses to say, I could talk about all this other stuff, but I really want to focus on your marriage because it matters, it has to be a serious business for us. It has to be something that we don't take lightly. It has to be something that we work at. The best way to avoid divorce is to take your covenant seriously. The best way to affair-proof and divorce-proof your marriage is to give yourself fully to your spouse. To put it in Genesis 2 terms, cleave with all your might. Listen to these sad, sad words from actress Ricky Lake. She says, it was a long time in the making, my divorce. One day became less special than the next. And pretty soon, we ceased all conversation. It's a sad day when you have nothing left to say. The road to divorce is paved with neglect. 
The road to a long marriage is built on passionate commitment. Maybe you're here this morning and you're wondering, is there hope? Our marriage is hard. We're struggling. Can I suggest to you that if there's a God in heaven, there's hope on earth. The same God who created light out of darkness, order out of chaos, and something out of nothing all by his word can actually do the same for your marriage. He can raise Jesus from the grave. He can raise your marriage from the dead. But you've got to take the first step. Maybe it's too late for you. You've already been through a divorce. Or worse, now, after listening, you know it wasn't biblical. Or maybe you've remarried. And now you know that wasn't biblical. Is there forgiveness? Of course there is. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's raising the bar. Why? To take us all the way back to the Beatitudes. To say, Jesus, I have nothing in me to bring. I'm poor in spirit. I have fallen short of the glory of God. I have violated the design for our lives, for my life in so many areas. And so when you're poor in spirit, what happens? You mourn over it. And it reduces you to humility. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be humbled. But he doesn't stop there. He says there is forgiveness and there is mercy. And he says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, he'll give it to you. If we repent, he'll wash us clean. We can start over. We can be fresh. We can have a new creation. In the words of the Old Testament prophet Joel, he will restore the years that were eaten away by locusts. Maybe you're in a second marriage or a third marriage, and you feel like, what do I do now? Can I suggest to you that you work hard at sanctifying this one, that you make sure that it sticks to the end? There is mercy, even for those of us who have committed porneia. And all of us have at least lusted. So start over again. The prince has come to turn all of us frogs into something better. He comes to give us his presence and power so that we can do all things through his strength. Larry Fortensky, Elizabeth Taylor's eighth husband, says that he felt less than he used to feel. Someone like an amputate, someone with like with an amputated limb or something. But can I suggest to you that because of Jesus, you don't have to stay there. There is hope for tomorrow when Jesus takes us there. So wherever you're at this morning, can I challenge you? Number one, pursue Jesus with all your heart. If you're single, pursue Jesus and say, God, I want to honor you with the choices I make in life now so that when you show me who you are calling me to live the rest of my life with, I'm ready. If you're married, can I suggest to you and encourage you pursue your wives, your spouses, cling to them. It is not a day-to-day of you marry and that's it. It's something you work at, you strive at, you pursue day in and day out. If you've gone through the mess of a divorce or a hard breakup, can I suggest to you that God's still faithful? He loves you. He cares for you. There is hope for you. Wherever you're at this morning, he's there. Do you know why I know he's there? Because every week at the end of service, we come and we celebrate the table. And the table reminds us that when we have fallen, when we had no way on our, in and of ourselves to fix ourselves, to get ourselves right, when we have destroyed our lives, when we were hopeless, he sent his son to take our place. When we should have received death, he died so that we could have life. When we should have received punishment, he took it for us. So this morning when we come to the table, we come knowing that we have a God who loves us, who cares for us, who loves our marriages, who loves our spouses, 
He loves our children, and he demands and encourages us to pursue these things because they matter. They matter to him. And so this morning, as we come to the table, I want to encourage you. Would you examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your desires? Where is the Holy Spirit convicting you this morning? What is the Holy Spirit dealing with you on this morning? Would you just let him minister to you as Chaz leads in worship? And as he is dealing with you, would you repent? Will you confess? Will you let his spirit bring healing into your life? And whenever you are ready, I invite you to come, grab the elements from either side of the sanctuary, and then you can come back to your seats, and I'll come up in a few moments, and we'll partake of the table together. But would you just examine and reflect and let the Holy Spirit minister to you in a few moments? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that our lives matter to you. These things that you teach us in scripture, you do it for our good. Our marriages matter to you. We believe that you're a God who orders our steps. You're the one who leads us every single day. So the reason that we are married this morning, if we're married, is because you're the one who led us there. And so God, whether it's difficult or hard or trying or good, this morning we need your help to trust you with our marriages to trust you that you will take care of us. And Father, there those who are single and waiting, I pray that you'd help us to trust that you have the perfect person, that we don't have to go running around and trying this person or that person, but as we pursue you and love you and follow you, in your perfect time, you will bring the right person to us. So God, help us to trust. God, I pray that you would soften our hard hearts. Help us to show mercy because we have been given tremendous mercy. Help us to, as husbands, to love the way that Christ loves. Help us to be willing to give our lives for our spouses. Father, thank you that our marriages, our relationships, our lives matter to you. Thank you that we belong to you, and thank you that we don't do this on our own, that you are with us every step of the way. So God, help all of us now. We love you. As we come to the table, God, I pray that your spirit will remind us how much you love us because of what Jesus did for us. Thank you for your goodness in our lives. We love you in Jesus.